and tissue perfusion. Assessment for coagulopathy even after the control of the bleeding, surgical, um, this does not target the end point of resuscitation because most of the majority of the patient have got normal coagul coagulation profile. Serious patient may have hypocoagulability. So life-threatening coagulopathy has been reported in shock, massive hemorrhage, and increase early transfusion requirement. That may lead to organ dysfunction. So uh, all the patient should have coagulation studies to initiate appropriate therapy. No, routinely, uh, PT, APTT, INR, and uh, platelet is being done, but they do not target hemostatic resuscitation. But in spite of damage control resuscitation, large volume of FP, Aggressive use can have adverse uh, complications. So most of the studies recommend the use of tag and rotten and hemostatic abnormalities like loss of fibrillation, thrombin generation, impaired platelet function, dysregulated fibrin lysis. All these changes can lead to acid-based disturbances and also the hypothermia. So that prolonged hypoperfusion uh, creates oxygen depth that is related to duration and depth of hyperperfusion. So it can lead to refractory shock as well. So adequate resuscitation is a challenge in the ICU. Over resuscitation, under resuscitation have got adverse consequences. So full restoration re is not required for only for resting bleeding or maintain hemodynamic, but to re-establish microcirculatory flow and organ hemostasis basically repay oxygen depth and otherwise organ dysfunction is going to occur. In this graph it shows a normal after the hemorrhage the patient develop oxygen deficit. If uh, it is being replaced then a full recovery is possible otherwise oxygen deficit may lead to delayed recovery with oxygen deficit. And if it persists, then it can lead to refractory shock and lethal cell injury and excessive oxygen depth. Uh, the end point for resuscitation includes micro, circulatory, and macro. The macro can be monitored by temperature, acidosis, urine output, and oxygen delivery by cardiac output, preload, contractility, afterload, oxygen capacity, and saturation. Now, after hemostasis is being attained, then one should focus on microcirculatory stability because the concerns are of endothelial dysfunction, impaired RBC, addition of RBC and WBC to endothelium. So in ICU, usually patient is provided with an anesthesia and sedated, and that is expected to reconstruct the blood vessel, dilate uh, uh, blood vessels and improve microvascular perfusion and maintain the systolic BP more than 100, heart rate less than 100, and normal urine output. Normalization of ABG is very important. Time okay. Achha. pH, lactate, base deficit suggests restoration of microcirculatory perfusion. So lethal triage should be corrected. That includes hypothermia, coagulopathy, acidosis. But the goal can be changed in patient with comorbid and CNS injury. So effective resuscitation has been assumed when normalization of lactate, base deficit, pH, organ failure, etc., central venous oxygen, oxygen consumption, uh, patient would have got a persistent base deficit and lactate level indicate occult hyperperfusion and it has got a poor outcome. So lactate is a better than uh, for occult hyperperfusion than base deficit because serial lactate level should be done in critically ill patients. If hemostasis achieve early, definitely it will limit the shock, underlying organ dysfunction, improved response can be resuscitation can be observed. Patient with prolonged can result in an organ dysfunction. So for the interventions, uh, whether it is surgical or coagulopathy, aggressive transfusion, if it is going in a patient, it indicates either there is a surgical bleed or irreversible shock or hematic dysfunction. 
To limit transfusion, one should consider surgical cause, angiography, re-evaluation, and to find out occult injuries and to discuss with the surgeon. Blood product has got itself adverse effect. This was a case report in which they say that doing less is better. But even there is a school of thought that under recitation can result in occult or cryptic shock and state of compensated shock can predispose to organ dysfunction in the ICU. So fluid suction also affect upon microcirculatory perfusion, goal of recitation after hemostasis and independent of volume expansion or oxygen care capacities. Some studies recommend Hestel, Hypertonic, 7% saline, Dextron have got a greater benefit than the crystalloid, but microcirculation is benefited by relative small initial bolus, small volume resuscitation pre-hospital, early stage of resuscitation is adjunct to hypotensive resuscitation. So to determine whether the patient is going to survive or not, if the patient is not responding to resuscitation, it indicates either patient has got occult injury or misinjury or ongoing hemorrhage or irreversible shock. Undiagnosed injury search by radiography, angiography, sonography, and operative uh, re-exploration. Acidosis, hypothermy, again become refractory to aggressive measure which can be taken. And uh, irreversible shock should be identified if there is unsuccessful, repeated, persistent effort to resuscitate the patient. Then futility is an issue to discontinue further resuscitative effort. This is a uh, report in which they recommend current concept evolving advancements in technology like aortic occlusion aorta for maintaining the systolic blood pressure use injury disability score to determine timing of intervention and also use thromboelastrography for coagulopathy. This is what happens, uh, the complications because ICU management provide organ protective support. Aggressive resuscitation can itself lead to the hemorrhage and septic shock. Complication of transfusion therapy includes trali, ARDS, and TACO, that is transfusion related overload, and TRIM also immune modulation. Hypothermia is one of the problems that can occur in the ICU and it can lead to coagulopathy, acidosis, dysarrhythmia, and infection. Renal damage, rhabdomyolysis with the polytrauma patient can occur, hyperkalemia, hypocalcemia, adrenal insufficiency, hyperglycemia, and if abdominal is involved, hypertension, abdominal compartment syndrome can develop. So to summarize, polytrauma patient with severe shock from hemorrhage and massive tissue injury present a major challenge for management of resuscitation in ICU. ICU intensivist must be prepared to receive patient in varying degree of stability and be ready to take over and complete resuscitation process. In some cases, finding tuning may be all that is required before addressing long-term critical care needs. In others, intensive must be prepared to undertake immediate massive resuscitation, correction of severe physiological derangement if the patient survives first 24-hour admission. How well the intensivist can prepare to meet these challenges may be critical affect 24-hour survival after severe injury and also development of potential life-threatening complications. As a patient becomes more fully stable, the ICU intensivist can then transition priorities towards longer range management issues. The past decades has been seen the radical changes in approaches in resuscitation from hemorrhage and polytrauma. These changes have drastically influenced how resuscitation is carried out in ER, OR, or in ICU. Future development will improve our understanding of microcirculation and interaction between hemostasis, inflammation, endothelium, and influence how we manage these complex and challenging patients. This is the data which has been collected uh, from uh, Shahid Motarma Benazir Bhutto uh, in, uh, Institute of Trauma from January to November 22. Uh, total, we have got admission about 1300 to 39, 
and they were being admitted in ICU were 66 and in ICU were 33%. In the mortality was 22% and ICU it was 31 and ICU it was 0.6. And these are all the polytrauma patients. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me remind that uh, first bell is on 12 minutes, second bell is on 15 minutes and you have maximum time of 18 minutes. So you completed the, your presentation in well in time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you ma'am for your presentation. I hope uh, you liked the presentation and have, and have taken some notes for the end. Our next topic is uh, tetanus and its ICU management. The speaker of this topic is Professor Dr. Safia Zafar Siddiqui. Dr. Safia Zafar Siddiqui graduated in 1986 from People's Medical College, Nawabshah. She passed MCPS in 1990 and FCPS in 2002. She also did MSc Pan Medicine in 2009. She is currently working as Head of the Department of Anesthesiology in Dow University of Health Sciences, Karachi. She is also examiner of MCPS, FCPS and Pan Medicine examinations. <coughs> During last five years, around 55 anesthesiologists are qualified from her department. First Pan Management Clinic in Sindh by the government of Sindh was established because of her special interest and dedication. Please welcome Dr. Safiya Zafar Siddiqui on stage. <laughs> ये टाइम मेरा नहीं है। Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you organizing committee for inviting me here. Uh, I will try to finish in time. Uh, in the next few minutes, we will discuss. <laughs> tetanus is uh, everybody knows. It is a uh, characterized by muscle spasm that is caused by tetanus toxin produced by uh, Clostridium tetani. And uh, in the last uh, many many years. It, uh, the tetanus and the relationship of traumatic injury were well known ongoing in ancient Greek and uh, Egyptian time. And it is in 1940s. And it is called, uh, at that time it is called as log jaw syndrome. Uh, health, uh, World Health Organization has, work, has done lots and lots of work on it. And because it is not a Western uh, country disease, so it's not a lot of new things that you will hear. So those things, because this is the problem of a poor country where vaccination is not done properly. That is why. The global burden is very much. That is estimated 48,000 to 80,000 80, deaths occurred in tetanus worldwide in 19, uh, 2016. And that is why it is uh, important to know uh, about uh, something about uh, uh, tetanus. Uh, it is caused by Clostridium tetani. Spores are uh, incom incompetently destroyed by boiling uh, and, and uh, eliminated by autoclaving one atmosphere. And this is the uh, uh, clinical condition. This is the clinical condition in which uh, Clostridium tetani produce toxins and the, this, the, 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 uh, you can see the body of the patient. It is because of the severe muscular skeletal muscle spasm. <coughs> the predisposing factors are penetrating injury or co-infection with other uh, bacteria, the vitalizing tissue and foreign body localized ischemia occur because of these toxins. Uh, and other things are splinters in other puncture wounds, gunshot injury, compound fracture, burns, and uh, other utensils. 
uh, tetanus in unusual uh, settings like uh, in uh, new nerves due to infection in umbilical uh, stems, in obstetric patients due to ase aseptic abortions, and these things are occurred in uh, low resource countries. And post surgical tetanus uh, occur in adolescents after circumcision in dirty places and uh, patients with dental infections, diabetic patients with infected ex extremities ulcers, patients with inject in with uh, dirty uh, uh, syringes. And then aner patho the, we should know little about the pathophysiology of the disease. It is because of the release of two enzymes, that is tetanospasmins and tetanolysin. Tetanolysin is capable of locally damaged viable tissue surrounding the infection and optimizing condition for bacterial multiplication. And tetanospasmin will lead to all clinical syndromes. That is the, that is the uh, clinical feature of the disease. And when it is uh, uh, toxin load is high, it uh, enters in bloodstream and uh, uh, go to central nervous system and causes other symptoms. I will skip it for uh, as the time is uh, not. Tetanus toxoid vaccination in pregnant women. Uh, this is a study done in Bhawalpur in which they, this, uh, they see that the neonatal tetanus is a serious disease in newborn baby and high mortality rate associated with it. In 2008, the estimated 59,000 newborn died because of the tetanus, this is neonatal tetanus. They said that there are five major factors for neonatal tetanus that is because of uh, unclean delivery practices, access to the awareness about tetanus and inadequate coverage of tetanus toxide vaccination, particularly TT5, and lack of herd immunity and data-based nithine capas. These things are important to know about tetanus. So, prophylaxis may hota kya hai ke immunization. Immunization uh, after uh, delivery, there are three uh, set of uh, immunization with the name of DPT, uh, two months, four months, six months, and then after every 10 years lifelong after every 10 years the clinical patterns are there are four types of usually generalized local cephalic and neonatal and uh, incubation period is eight days to but ranges from three to 21 days if it occurs just after injury it will be serious mostly and if it occurs after 20 days or 25 days it will be a uh, milder form the most common and severe is generalized tetanus and uh, in ICU care mostly the generalized tetanus comes to the ICU. <coughs> the clinical feature in these uh, patients are uh, manifest early phase of sweating and tachycardia because of the autonomic uh, instability and uh, in later phase uh, illness profuse sweating, cardiac arrhythmias, labile, uh, hypertension, hypotension and fever are most uh, often. Patients with tetanus characteristically have uh, tonic uh, contraction of their skeletal muscle and intermittent uh, intense muscular spasm and it is very painful. They, these patients need uh, good analgesia in the form of opioid and non-opioid. <coughs> and, the, and these uh, things are triggered by loud noises and uh, touch, light, so we should be careful with these patients. Tonic and periodic spastic muscular contractions are responsible for most classical findings of tetanus, that is uh, stiff neck, opisthotonus, rhesus uh, sardinus, and board like rigidity, and these things. So, they classify these uh, uh, forms of tetanus into four uh, forms, that is called uh, ablet, uh, mild, moderate, severe, and uh, very severe. In ICU, mostly the severe and very severe patients are admitted in ICU and they, they, they have uh, severe trismus, generalized spasticity, prolonged spasm, respiratory rate more than 40, dysphagia, apneic spells, and pulse more than 120. And uh, these patients should be admitted in ICU care. And this is the patient admitted right now in my ICU. It was, he was admitted with the very little uh, mouth opening, one finger. And uh, this is better condition, and now he is much better. Laga shukar hai. And abdomen was rigid. Drug induced uh, dystonia, uh, differential diagnosis is must to exclude. Because if label agar lag jata hai ki tetanus ka patient admit ho raha hai aur sab usko tetanus ke hi tarah treat karne lage, it should not be the criteria. You should 
go by uh, differential diagnosis and the, the diagnosis of uh, tetanus is purely cl uh, clinical. Management, uh, treatment strategies involve three management uh, principles. Organism present in the, in the body should be destroyed to prevent further toxin release. It, it should be done by debridement of the wound. If the wound is not getting then you should be, you should find, उसको पीछे देखें आगे देखें कहीं ना कहीं पे कोई वूंड मिल जाता है और उसको ढूंढना पड़ता है और जब मिले तो उसकी डिब्राइमेंट इज मस्ट टॉक्सिन प्रेजेंट इन द बॉडी आउटसाइड द सीएनएस शुड बी न्यूट्रलाइज द इफेक्ट ऑफ टॉक्सिन ऑलरेडी इन द सीएनएस शुड बी मिनिमाइज तो इसमें फिर करते क्या है कि ह्यूमन टेटनस इम्यूनोग्लोबुलिन इज द एंटी टॉक्सिन चॉइस ऑफ न्यूट्रलाइज अनबॉन्ड टॉक्सिन एंड द यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स सेंटर्स द डिजीज कंट्रोल एंड प्रिवेंशन Uh, recommend single dose 500 units of uh, intramuscular isse pehle previously we, we, uh, the dose was 3000 to 6000 units and uh, uh, this tox this uh, uh, globulin should be administered as soon as the diagnosis of tetanus is considered with the part of dose infiltrated around the wound active immunization is must in these patient when this the diagnosis is must You, you should do this uh, active immunization. The other things which should control the uh, clinical condition of the patients are benzodiazepines. The diazepam is the drug of choice, or valium is the drug of choice, and, uh, uh, and it is used most frequently in ICU and outside ICU if patient is in the ward, they are using it. Starting the dose of diazepam with 10 to 30 milligram and repeated as needed after every one to four hours, but you should be careful to see the sedation, level of sedation, level of uh, uh, airway reflexes, it should, it should all be considered important. And uh, continuous infusion of uh, IV midazolam is also important and we are using it uh, very frequently. The other thing is uh, uh, several, uh, to block adrenergic uh, autonomic response is the magnesium sulfate and it is the gold standard drug. I think everybody is using it for the tetanus. And it has been studied in a randomized control trial in tetanus because it is used clinical series of management of autonomic dysfunction and adjective uh, treatment for the controlling spasm. Why it is important that it acts as presynaptic uh, neuromuscular blocker, blocks catecholamine release from nerves reduce receptor responsiveness to catecholamines and uh, it has advantage of worldwide experience in the treatment of eclampsia. So everybody knows about uh, magnesium sulfate and it is a very safe drug if you are using carefully and uh, the level of magnesium sulfate should not cross the therapeutic level. Otherwise the toxicity of uh, magnesium sulfate will occur and it will complicate the patient. The randomized uh, double-blind uh, control uh, trial of 256 hospitalized patients with severe tetanus in Vietnam, magnesium sulfate infusion compared with placebo control autonomic dysfunction. The patient were randomly assigned to other thing is beta blocker uh, and opioids. Labitolol. Sometimes it is important to give labitolol has frequently been uh, admit, administered in these patients if it is required. And uh, beta blocker alone with, with propanol, for example, should be avoided because it causes sudden death of the patient. The, for pain, morphine is very helpful drug, very important drug because the muscle spasm is so intense, so painful, so morphine is not available. Sab log e bolenge. So the other thing is weak opioids, that is uh, nalbufin. We are using nalbufin in this patient with paracetamol or with some other NSAIDs to uh, reduce the pain of the patient. Next is uh, baclofen. Baclofen IV is not available in Pakistan and uh, it is uh, used uh, IV and uh, intrathecal use and uh, uh, it is available in the tablet form in Pakistan, 20 milligram and uh, 10 milligram tablets. And this is study shows that uh, they are using it intrathecally. They reduce the symptoms, but on mortality, it is not very helpful. Sometimes, sometimes it is not recommended, but sometimes we have to use this neuromuscular blocking agent to reduce the spasm for some time if it is very severe and uh, uh, we cannot control it. For the time being, when uh, magnesium ka level maintain kar rahe hain, we can use these drugs. <coughs> Uh, 
uh, other thing is the, uh, the study uh, occurred in Brazil. Isme inhone use kiya uh, intrathecal immunoglobulins. Lekin isme bhi inhone kaha ki mortality was not significantly affected. Lekin symptoms inhone control kar liye the isse. The isme is, ab is pure ko nutshell mein kis tarah hum kahenge ki the uh, start uh, uh, metronidazole intravenously 500 milligram three times a day to control uh, anaerobic situation. Give tetanus human immunoglobulin 3,000 to 6,000 unit, but now it is re recommended that 500 intramuscular uh, should be given. Admit to ICU, commence oxygen, obtain IV access, and attach monitoring. Uh, alert surgeon to perform uh, uh, radical uh, uh, debridement. And it is very important. Very much. You have to remove the focus. Uh, slow loading of diazepam and uh, start diazepam 10, milli 10 milligrams 6 hourly, increase uh, to hourly if required, titrate symptom, start magnesium sulfate, to pella kaam bhi saath saath kar dena chahiye, start magnesium sulfate. Magnesium sulfate can depress heart, so you should be very careful, give it slowly, as recommended in books. Phenobarbitone is uh, another drug, and some time trichostomy is required. If patient is on ventilator and on prolonged ventilator, trichostomy is required to wean uh, smoothly, easily from ventilator. Intermittent positive pressure ventilation is required sometime by giving uh, in, uh, neuromuscular blocking agent. General care, the hydration is must. So you have to give fluid as recommended 10 ml, 15 ml per kg per hour. Nutrition is must. If I have seen myself, हमारे पास पेशेंट देखते देखते छोटे हो जाते हैं पतले हो जाते हैं तो न्यूट्रिशन इज मस्ट इलेक्ट्रोलाइट बैलेंस डीवीटी प्रोफाइलैक्सिस टेक्रोस्टोमी केयर एंड जनरल नर्सिंग केयर ऑल दिस थिंग्स आर इंपॉर्टेंट बस खत्म कर रहे कॉम्प्लिकेशन में कॉम्प्लिकेशन में अगर विद द डिजीज लैरोस्पाज्म एंड हाइपोक्सिया कॉम्प्लिकेशन ऑफ ट्रीटमेंट सेडेशन लीडिंग टू कोमा एस्पिरेशन एपनिया वेंटिलेटर एसोसिएटेड निमोनिया एक्यूट रेस्पिरेटरी डिस्ट्रेस सिंड्रोम गैस्ट्रिक अल्सर दिस थिंग्स हैपन इन आईसीयू व्हिच इज कॉमन uh, bradycardia, tachycardia because of autonomic instability and magnesium sulfate, high output renal failure, <coughs> tetanus is entirely preventable by vaccination, however it remains a major health problem worldwide, especially in poor countries. In developed countries, severe grade uh, present uh, in elderly and uh, unimmunized patient, mortality is high in these patients uh, remains high, prolonged intensive care support may be necessary, but most treatment is based on limited resources. Major therapeutic challenges lie in control of muscular rigidity, spasm treatment and auto autonomic disturbance, and the prevention of complication associated with prolonged critical illness. For the developed, developing countries, tetanus is major challenges with high mortality among all age groups. The use of magnesium sulfate to avoid long-term ventilation is whole, hopeful development and will need to further evaluation. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your time. Our next presentation is Fluid Stewardship in Sepsis and will be presented by Dr. Sayyid Farjad Sultan. Dr. Farjad Sultan is consultant anesthesia at Dow University of Health Sciences and currently heading the anesthesia services of university. After MBBS from Dow Medical College in 2002, he completed his fellowship training in Ireland from College of Anesthetist Ireland in 2009. He got his CSST in 2013. He also has a fellowship in ultrasound guided peripheral nerve blockage from Cork University Hospital in 2010 and in critical care in 2013. He did not stop there. He was also awarded a PhD in anesthesia and intensive care in 2015 from University College Cork of National University Ireland. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Sayed Farjad Sultan. Sir, did you start the timer? Did you start the timer? Yes, when you start the timer, you will start the timer. Okay, let's go. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.
Right. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Uh, so it's fluid stewardship in sepsis. Uh, we can use it in sepsis or otherwise. We had a very nice presentation yesterday on burns. But uh, let's just, it's, it's a sort of different, it's a paradigm shift. And this is something that we all need to think about. Uh, we've all heard of antibiotic stewardship. It's time we started thinking about fluids. So no conflict of interest. Uh, why is fluid stewardship important? Well, we need to define what is fluid overload. One, there is no universally accepted definition. It does not exist. The most acceptable one is an expansion of extracellular fluid volume with a positive fluid balance that produces a weight gain of greater than 10% from baseline. That's the most accepted one, but how many of us actually know our patient's baseline and how much is the weight gain? When do we start the baseline is a separate question. What are the problems we can see from uh, that it happens in every single system that exists in the body? Then the complication, but it, it increases mortality. It increases the length of stay. It causes acute kidney injury and everything else. Why does it happen and how does it happen? But there are four mechanisms it happens. One is uh, aggressive fluid resuscitation. So the sepsis one bundle, I'm just going to take an example. For patients with sepsis and hypotension, suggest 30 ml per kg in the first hour. But if you have 120 kg patient coming in, that's 3,600 ml in the first hour. Really? Who gives that much fluid for, I mean, in the first hour? That's a huge amount of fluid without knowing the condition of the patient's heart, lungs, and all that. So the outcomes per ideal adjusted uh, or total body weight have not been evaluated. Hence, recommendations cannot be made. But it has been suggested in practice Precision-based resuscitation using small boluses and dynamic assessment of fluid responses may be beneficial. That's the maximum that they have said. They cannot give any firm fixed fast rule that this is what you do. And approximately half of the patient administered fluid challenges will be fluid responsive. And this is, again, a huge statement uh, and it is quite well published that despite extensive evidence and guidelines to support dynamic indices to predict fluid responsiveness, static measures are still commonly used. And we all know that. So there is a lack of knowledge as well. Again, we need to understand all measures have limitations. We don't have the perfect measure for anything. But the lack of dynamic indices may contribute to the overload as well. Then we have the hidden fluids, which are the requisite fluids administered as, as part of routine care. These are fluids which are not prescribed, but you know, giving a bit of flush, a bit of diluent for IV fluids, these are unmeasured. So if you look at it, it's a huge load. We have the persistent use of uh, maintenance fluid. There was a study, point providence study of 49 ICUs uh, in Europe and America. And they found 62% of ICU patients received maintenance fluid despite over 80% receiving full nutrition. So someone is getting full nutrition and they're getting maintenance fluid as well. I mean, it's just too much fluid. So what to do about it? <coughs> so there has been this huge debate of who is responsible for it. Is it the doctors? Is it the paramedics? Ground reality is all of us are responsible for it. But Practically, we are not there with the patients 24-7. Who are there with the patients? These are the paramedics. So the thought process has changed. We need to teach things. We need to learn things so that it makes things easier for the paramedics to look after the patients, something that they know how to do. So this is what they have suggested. This is what is taught to all paramedics for patient care, for Pharmacy, and this is the concept from there. The four rights, the four R's, the right patient, the right drug, the right route, and the right dose. This was previously the four D's of fluid therapy, the drug, dose, duration, de-escalation, but they suggested the four R's as a change towards patient care. The four D's we can, we do as doctors, but as doctors, ground reality is we go, we prescribe, we walk away to the next patient. Who is looking after the patient? The paramedical staff. So we need to modify our thought process to make it easier for them to understand. So what is the right patient? 
Is it the right patient for fluid resuscitation or the right patient for maintenance fluid? They've also suggested the ROSE model, which is rescue optimization, stabilization, and evacuation. The rescue is the first critical minutes of life-saving support. That is where we come in as doctors. Optimization is guided by the dynamic indices to, fune -tune, to fine tune the therapy. This is where we come in. And this is generally combined in resuscitation. So this is the right patient for fluid resuscitation. For the right patient for maintenance fluid, stabilization and evacuation, which happens over days and weeks. So this is where the paramedical staff comes in. So we need to divide the care as per time. It makes life easier for, the, for us, for the paramedical staff, and it saves lives. It's being very practical. The right drug, the patient-specific factors and the phase of fluid resuscitation will dictate the fluid choice. Uh, what is the optimal resuscitation fluid, which will provide immediate and sustained increase in intravascular volume aimed at improving stroke volume, cardiac output, and blood pressure? Well, it does not exist. We all know that. There's a huge problem. The principles of fluid uh, composition are governed by the osmotic pressure, which is total solutes per unit volume. So hypertonic, isotonic, or hypotonic. The oncotic pressure, which is the osmotic pressure exerted by proteins in the intravascular space. This will shift volume from extravascular into intravascular, and the acid-base balance. So as a general rule, if strong ion difference, cation or anion of infusion fluid is greater than, baseline, than the baseline bicarb, the pH will tend to move towards alkalosis and vice versa. Bit complicated to think through, but it is a, as a general rule. So colloids, starches, crystalloids have all been extensively studied. Normal saline per 9 percent is the most commonly used fluid despite its negative effects. It causes hypochloremic metabolic acidosis. GI intestinal edema, it causes ileus, renal vasoconstriction, AKI, increases the need of uh, RRT, it increases intraoperative blood loss, it causes postoperative complication, it has been known to, known to increase mortality. Despite all that, it is available, it is written down in every resuscitation fluid. The reason is, it is easily available, relatively easy to produce and store. Ground reality. Maintenance fluid are the core component of support care. Most recommendation uh, regarding fluid choice are opinion-based. Everybody has their own opinion, so you can't give a firm fix guidelines. Hypertonic solutions cause hyponatremia and significant adverse events. Despite that, we all know uh, that it is still prescribed, and hence evidence-based guidelines are quite lacking. Then we have the right route. Should we give it enteral or parenteral? Uh, for enteral resuscitation, only animal models are available. I mean, if you think about it, you want, no one's going to go to the IRB saying, this patient has an acute abdomen, has an ileus. Instead of giving IV fluid, I want to randomize and give them fluid via the NG. Or uh, someone who has a gunshot wound anywhere, we want to see how the gut absorbs. We're not going to get the IRB approval at all. Uh, the enteral route preferentially fills the interstitial compartment before the IV compartment. Uh, the hidden fluids, you know, it's an early conversion of IV antibiotics to oral or enteral route, if appropriate, and we need to measure all the ins and outs. Regarding the right dose, uh, we need to develop, individualize, uh, even though hospitals protocolize assessment and management of fluid requirement. All things are poison and nothing is without poison. Only the dose permits something not to be poisonous. This was said by Paracelsius, and I think it was uh, 200 BC, or maybe before that. So in conclusion, the four major indications for fluid administration in the critically ill are resuscitation, maintenance, replacement, and nutrition. Please, please, please do not forget nutrition, enteral or parenteral. A lot of our patients are there in ICU, and sometimes we sort of, in life-saving things, nutrition takes uh, second priority. We need to save lives first. It doesn't matter whether you use the 4Ds, 4Rs, Rose model. Just use a model. The four basic questions which surround fluid therapy are, and this is when we're starting 
or when we have a patient is when to start fluids, when to stop fluid, when to start fluid removal, and when to stop fluid removal. So we need to start thinking on that. How do we get along with fluid uh, stewardship? Well, it's a three-pronged attack. We need to educate. Uh, this is why we have conferences. We need to give out the information why it is important. We need to change our own prescribing habits. We need to look at what we do. If you look at all our, our ICU patients, most, if not all, will be fluid overloaded. We will be over-prescribing them. They will be getting more fluid than required, and we need to increase the awareness. Thank you very much. So, Ghanti se pehle. Sir, pehli ghanti hamare na, wo 20 minute ki hoti hai. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your great presentation. <clears throat> Our last topic of this session is post-intensive care syndrome, which will be presented by Dr. Hamidullah. Dr. Hamidullah is Associate Professor of Anesthesia and currently working in Aga Khan University, Karachi. After graduation from Dow Medical College in 1991, he completed his FCPS in Anesthesia from Aga Khan University, Karachi. He is an asset of Pakistan Society of Anesthesiologists. He is also a member of Pakistan Medical Commission and Association of Anesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland. He received Best Teacher Award in Aga Khan University in 2011 and Faculty Development Award in 2004. Please welcome on stage Dr. Hamidullah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, so I'm standing between you and the T. So uh, not a nice place to be. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much uh, uh, for giving me this opportunity. I'm always grateful to the organizers and uh, thoroughly enjoy the uh, Peshawar hospitality. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about uh, post-intensive care syndrome. I have no conflict to declare. What is an outcome? Uh, in ICU, we monitor outcomes. And uh, outcome is only what we look for. So what we generally look for in ICU is mortality. We look for infection rates, ventilator days, organ failures and organ supports, length of stay, and so on and so forth. But if you look at all these outcomes, they begin in the intensive care unit, they end there. But the patient doesn't stop here. Patient goes back to the wards, to special cares, high dependency, then the general wards, then they go home and to the society. Let's see what happens when these patients go out. Uh, this is a graph showing pre-admission status of these patients, and they have followed them up for 72 months. And you can see most of them do not get back to the position that they were before their admission to ICU. And greater the severity of uh, illness and greater the risk factors, the greater the number of patients not getting back to where they started. So there is something going on after we discharge them from ICU. What, we, what happens with them because of their disease process and what we do with them as part of treatment. Uh, we do things that decrease the muscle strength, hypoperfusion happens, we predispose them to delirium, uh, there is uh, altered thirst and nutrition, all of that leads to, uh, in addition, with the hazards of bed rest and hospitalization, immobilization, diet issues, low plasma volumes, low ventilation, social isolation, sedating mechanisms. To summarize, what happens is they develop weakness, they develop cognitive impairment, organ dysfunctions, and psychological problems. This all leads to increased mortality, inability to return to their social roles, 
recurrent health care needs even after discharge, and there is a burden on the caregivers as well. So these are the elements that happens in critical care depending on uh, various factors, uh, primarily the disease and the care given in intensive care. So bringing them all together, this is known as post-intensive care syndrome, which is a collection of physical, mental, and cognitive symptoms that continue to persist after the patient leaves the intensive care unit. So this is called PICS, and the portion of PICS that happens with the family and caregivers is called PICS family or PICS F. So what are the symptoms of uh, post-intensive care syndrome? So the family suffers from mental health issues, which is anxiety, uh, autism disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, depression, and complicated grief. So this uh, family issues will definitely impact the care of the patients as well. The survivors of the intensive care unit have three different type of abnormalities. One related to mental health, the second one to cognition, and the third to physical impairment. Uh, the mental health I have already discussed is the same as with the families. In cognitive impairment, they have uh, issues with their memories, attention, and uh, mental processing speed. So in, in summary, they have problems with understanding, uh, remembering, learning, and thinking. And with regards to the physical impairment, they have primarily neuromuscular and physical function disorders. And some of them develop this to an extent that they have issues with their pulmonary functions. If we put them into a uh, perspective of uh, percentage wise, the highest is 16%, uh, which is cognitive impairment alone, 13% depression, and 7% disability. This is after 12 months of discharge from ICU. And only 44% patients are free from this syndrome. There is all, there, there are all type of overlaps and about 4% of patients have everything. So this is, this is important, this is serious. What do we do to contribute to this uh, post-intensive care syndrome? We stop following these patients. We have, we have been deliberately doing uh, things to reduce the incidences of delirium, to reduce incidences of neuromuscular disorders, post-intensive post care uh, neuropathies, myopathies, but when we discharge them, we stop following them. And when they go out of intensive care unit, uh, in, in, in most places, there's nobody to coordinate the care. The primary physician and the primary surgeons lack knowledge about this syndrome, uh, and there are many, patient, many uh, physicians and surgeons who are looking after the patient from different perspectives. Simple decisions like uh, starting off antipsychotics or stopping antipsychotics. We, have been, we, have, we, we are using vasopressors in intensive care units. When they go back, the diseases are resolved. They develop hypertension again. There's a huge delay in restarting their antihypertensives. And the, the more importantly, the family and the home support that becomes very important in this part of rehabilitation is not as good as has been perceived in the initial stages of illness. What can we do to minimize this? We can't take this off. We can only minimize this. It's a A, B, C, D. So awaken them. Don't let them sleep for a long period of time in the intensive care unit. Let them breathe on their own, even if for short periods of time. Coordinate the care so that the families are much more involved. Always assess for delirium and do everything you can to prevent this. It's very difficult to treat the delirium. It's best to prevent this. Mobilize them. Even if they can't get out of the bed, 
turn them on the sides frequently. Follow them up. Involve the family in decisions and engagement. Do functional reconciliation. Post-ICU clinics are the best part that can deal with this. Uh, develop peer support groups in the, uh, in the institution, which can provide them psychological support. I, I'm sure every institution which have intensive care would have psychologists. There has to be very good hand of communication when you hand over your patient to another uh, physician. And most of the lacking happens in that point, in, at that time. Give written information to the family. Educate them. Give them videos. Maintain ICU diaries. And create the right environment for their discharge. Not every patient needs everything. They need individualized, personalized care to become a useful member of the society. You know, if they don't become a useful member, it aggravates the situation further. Uh, what has to be done in, when, the, when the patients are in the hospital? First three months, first 12 months, after that, there are several protocols lying there. Assess their needs. Do interventions that would help them. Uh, and, and take it from there. This is again that A, B, C, D, E. Awake and breathe, coordinate, this is the same thing. Okay. In the end, I will read the memoirs from a patient who has suffered this. Uh, this is Nancy Andrews, a creative artist. Uh, I, I cannot put feelings in this, but this is, this is something uh, that touched me. So for three weeks, I was held in a room. If I tried to get away, they would tie me to the bed. I couldn't eat. I could barely sleep and couldn't speak. Groups of people would come into my room and look at me and talk about me and sometimes undress me. I was shot full of drugs. I was too weak to move. I couldn't see my body, but I had been cut nearly in half. There were insects on the walls and ceiling. I was in a boat in the bottom of an underground waterway. I was in a deep well. I was tethered to the ground by rubber tubes attached to my genitals. I was in a space pod. I was in a raft, in a library, in a conference room, in a fly-by-night health clinic. I was in the Arctic, I was in the desert. They were trying to kill me. They tried to get me into a room separate from everyone else or wait so late at night. Some part of this is actually happening and some part of this is the big hallucination bit that she's suffering from. And, and most of our patients do suffer. They do not express, but they do suffer. Where was I? They asked me this question every day and I didn't knew the answer. I was in the intensive care unit, the ICU of one of the best hospitals in the world, where doctors and nurses were using the most current medical technologies and knew how to save my life. Physically, what had happened to me? In the hospital, they saved my life, and for this, I am deeply grateful. But life after this ICU experience was extraordinarily difficult. The memories weren't of things that had really happened there. So you can feel the pain that she's suffering from. There is no easy fix, no pill or clear drug therapy. It's a long and complex journey. And in the end, she gives some suggestions. I can continue to update my blog and web pages for those of us who need more information. And I can also share advice from my experiences. For those people like me, reach out, talk about your memories, draw, dance, do physical therapy, do talk therapy, listen to music, learn new things, talk to your doctor, ask for help and for therapy and, and for friends and family. Notice those changes in your loved ones, whether they are in the hospital and they are acting strangely. Let the staff know. 
when you get home, talk to somebody if they seem to have cognitive and psychological changes. And don't give up on that old person who comes home from a prolonged ICU stay showing signs of dementia. These symptoms could be reversible. This is the time to coordinate care between the cognitive, the psychological, and the physical. The sooner we get help, the better we do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hamidullah. With this ends our presentations. Now I would, I would request our panel of chair for their final comments. Uh, Dr. Mehdi Hassan Muntaz, would you like to comment on the session? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Kalu subhana kala ilma dana illa ma allam dana inna kanta lalimul hakim. All the poll papers were very good, up to the mark. But I have got some views to say a few lines about the fluid and electrolyte and fluid therapy. As we do, if we want to correct ourselves, so the formula is you correct yourself from inside out. When you are plan your fluid therapy, we fill the body from inside out. Inside is a vessel. Outside to vessel is the interstitial compartment. Outside to interstitial compartment is the cell. First of all, you satisfy the vessel because the vessels are taking the nutrition and oxygen to the tissue. Then you satisfy the interstitial compartment. Then you satisfy the intercellular compartment. Basic fluid therapy. It's for the junior doctors, please. Uh, seniors should ignore it for the but basic fluid therapy when we plan it we always plan 1 to 1.5 to 2 mil per kilogram per hour and if we look at its kinetics we produce urine 1 mil per kilogram per hour and we are left with only 1 mil per kilogram per hour we lose the fluid in the form of sweat or insensible loss 0.5 mil per kilogram per hour then we left with only 0.5 mil, and that 0.5 mil is required for the homeostasis of the body. Now this fluid therapy, when we gave it, we also look three compartments. There are two partitions which are controlling it. Now always I've seen most of the people they try to give crystal to resuscitate the person. For example, if the patient comes with a polytrauma, there is no problem with the capillary at this moment. There is no infection. The only contraindication to the cool, colloid fluid is this. Immediately is the sepsis or burn patients. Do not use any colloids in the beginning till the capillary poles start becoming to the normal side. So if you, for example, if you give saline or sodium containing fluids, its volume distribution is only intravascular volume and interstitial volume it stops going to the cell because at the cell fluid transfer is controlled by osmolarity or osmolarity. Now if you look at the extracellular fluid volume, it is two-thirds of the total bo body water. Out of two-thirds, again, out of one-third, again two-thirds is in the interstitial compartment. Now if you give one liter of saline to person, 660 mil will go into interstitial compartment. Only you, 330 or 370 will be left in the vessel. So if you want to resuscitate uh, 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 to give one liter, to keep one liter in the intravascular compartment, you will have to give three liter of saline. So why not to give colloid which stays in the vessel? In my opinion, if there is no contraindication to colloid otherwise, initial resuscitation should be with the colloid solution, but how would we monitor it? Central venous pressure, if the patient is uh, uh, ordinary or in any case we will put the central venous pressure. If the patient is on ventilator, then the central venous pressure 
cannot give you the exact amount of fluid should be given to that patient, then we have to push the transesophageal echo. Now you pulse pressure variation or uh, 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 what we call as uh, uh, stroke volume variation. They will guide you the exact amount to be given. This is my comment a little bit about the fluid therapy. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Our second chair today was Dr. Ashraf Sia. Sir, would you like uh, to comment? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Kul rabbi zidna, kul rabbi zidni ilma. Thank you very much. Uh, sir has given a very detailed uh, discussion about fluid management, and I think the time uh, which was uh, not taken up by Dr. Farjad has been very nicely covered by Sir Padma Mataz. So this was really a very uh, nice uh, presentation and topic uh, covered by all the uh, speakers. First of all, uh, Madam uh, Sadka Aftab elaborated in a very nice way management of polytrauma patients and exactly the same patient uh, we are dealing in our ICU with polytrauma with pelvic winding and uh, fluid challenges. And second, uh, Madam Safiya Zafar has uh, very nicely and in detail given the treatment of tetanus, its management because it's a very uh, frequently, we receive patients in ICU and we have a lot of challenges for their management. Uh, fluid stewardship has been uh, discussed in detail by uh, Professor Mehti or Merakalus me koi cheez rehe nahi kai. Ek bada important topic jo uh, Professor uh, Midula ne jo uh, Associate Professor Ramidola ne jo bhi elaborate kiya. We come across this post-intensive care syndrome and this is the topic which is uh, most of the time is neglected in ICU and these patients have ICU psychosis when they are discharged from them. So this is very important that we should have a feedback from these patients or uske baad we can improve ke how to uh, uh, minimize uh, these complications one suggestion which was given one of uh, presentation was that the family should be frequently involved in ICU management. But in our setup, we cannot involve the family to that extent because the way they are entering in ICU, that uh, creates a lot of trouble for management. So all the presentations were very nice and up to mark and uh, we had a lot of uh, knowledge sharing and thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Our third panelist today was Dr. Tahir Ali. I would like to request him to comment on the session. Please. Thank you very much. So um, I was going to comment on the post IC intense care syndrome because that's something very, very, very pop, very uh, big on. Uh, but first, I have to comment on the fluids. Um, I'm afraid, I think just because something physiologically makes sense, it doesn't necessarily translate to evidence. And I think. It's important for us to try our best to move away from opinions and go with best evidence. So if we were to look at the sequence of events in terms of the trials, there are far too many trials to discuss in one minute, starting from the SAFE trial, prior, and then following that the VZEP trial, and then following that the ALBIOS trial, and then there are multiple trials looking at colloids versus crystalloids, and even crystalloids balanced versus non-balanced. So if you were to summary, my little recommendation is we have together a group of um, uh, intensivists and trainees put together a website called The Bottom Line in that to make life simple for trainees and for their exams, we summarize every single paper, every single research article, we critically appraise it and we ensure the pros and cons and being very honest about them when it's a bad trial. So if you Google bottom line, it is free. You can access all the data. In summary, I think from what the, uh, you mentioned in your presentation, I suspect the reason why saline is still in all the uh, guidelines is because there's a SALT ED trial and then there's multiple other trials that have shown that it doesn't actually worsen mortality even though we all see that horrible hypochloremic metabolic acidosis. We know we see it. And of course, the latest trial looking at crystalloids versus colloids is the 6S trial. And of course, it shows an increase in mortality. It shows an increase in renal replacement therapy. So doesn't translate to evidence. And when we're talking about leak, there is an albumin, there is a natural albumin leak anyway. And therefore, when you administer albumin, it will absolutely temporarily cause an oncotic pressure. Of course, 
then it will leak out. And more importantly, it does not translate to evidence. The only colloid which does not increase mortality or morbidity, which has been extensively studied, is albumin. But there is no evidence that it actually improves anything. The only thing you're doing is you end up, and I do, t do tend to give albumin sometimes when I don't want to give too much fluid because I have evidence that it does not increase mortality. But it's just a more expensive way of giving the same thing. So that's my little thing over there. My question actually to the post-intensive care syndrome one was, um, do you use patient diaries? And actually that's something we use a lot where pen and a little book diary and the nurses will write their journey. The family can come and write in it as well because what we also find is there are these blank there's the periods of amnesia, they can't recall various events. And actually that we find is quite useful for them to uh, fill in those blanks. Um, and also do you use pick up pickups um, uh, screening tool for following up your post, your intensive care trainees? Thank you. Yes, we have used diaries in very few patients, maybe on one hand fingers, four or five patients. They have been very useful, and uh, uh, we plan, uh, actually the, the patient lot that we get is very different from what you get. And uh, writing while being in intensive care is not something that is common. Uh, and most patients also would not like to do that as well. Uh, only the uh, very educated ones and who have very good family support. We have seen four or five patients who would write uh, what, what they feel, what, what is going on with them. And uh, for the, the tune-up things, no, we don't. No, so I, I meant the patient diaries where it's for the patient and the nurse writes this happened to you today, this was done, other people came into the room, and where the family can also write about their days. We don't write this, okay. but we do this as a nursing practice. Mm -hmm. But we don't write this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any question or comments from the audience? Thank you very much, sir. Uh, my question is uh, regarding the management of uh, a tetanus patient in ICU. I was just wondering uh, that uh, whether we uh, do the tracheostomies to avoid the over-sedation or as a part of, uh, you know, the airway management. Your few words, Professor Mehdi. Thank you. <laughs> question, uh, uh, Professor uh, Imran Skander has you asked. Repeat your question, okay? Sir, there are questions that the over-sedation complications are avoided. Do you have any questions for tracheostomies? Or do you have complications for spasms? Airway compromise हुआ होता है तो उसकी वजह से करते हैं. Your few words. While a patient is in ICU, there are definite indications for it, doing the tracheostomy. Any patient who is going to stay more than seven to ten days, we always plan do the tracheostomy. Any patient if we uh, pre as, uh, think that the patient is going to, now we immediately do the tracheostomy also. And if the patient comes with a respiratory obstruction, then we assess it to bypass the uh, obstruction, then we do the tracheostomy. And sometimes, if it is prolonged, you have to have a better hygiene of the mouth and better care, nursing care, then we also do the tracheostomy and explain to the patient the relatives and the patient, if the patient can understand these things also. So it depends. So otherwise, if you look at the indication of tracheostomy written by ENT people, they start from A up to 
why and then say there are yet more indications to do the tracheostomy also. So it is, it is decided individually on individual patients also. So you can do the, I mean you can reduce the uh, sedation and uh, by doing the tracheostomy but the sedation is so important in intensive care unit because when I went to Birmingham hospital I went for one purpose, there was a professor of Winson. He was a very well known teacher and and when I went there, he was on ventilator. And uh, because they did the ventri ventriculography and that time there was no CT scan. And I used to sit by his side at night and used to say, I have come to learn from you and you are lying here, you will have to come back. It went on for six weeks. Then they declared his brain is dead, but there were no guidelines that time for the brain, dead brain. Then the, his, his uh, ass assistant said, no, I'm not going to disconnect it from the ventilator. After another six weeks, he came around. The only thing he said when he woke up, and he's still alive, he's 97 years old. He said, the one, two things were bothering me. One is the noise of the door of the ICU. And second thing was somebody used to come and say me that I have to come back. Then I said that it was me and he became a very good friend. And he, he taught me so much. He taught me physiology, respiratory physiology in a mathematical way. Every morning we used to go to canteen and have a tea and he used to discuss with me. So sedation is very important also. We indicate tracheostomy is not, never ever done by avoid, for avoiding the sedation. Sedation is very important. Assalamu alaikum. My question is Dr. Safiya Zafar. What is recommended uh, evidence-based duration of treatment for IV metronidazole in tetanus patient? I think five days ago. Book me to ye likha hai. Aapka thoda sir ne bilkul sahi bola. I totally agree with him. But tracheostomy is hoti hi hai airway protect karne ke liye. Jis patient ki maine picture dikhai thi, ye mera patient takriban thik ho gaya hai. Bagay tracheostomy ke. Isko zarurat nahi padi. Isko sedation level ham monitor karte rahe, karte rahe. Din ko, raat ko bahut vigilant monitoring chahiye hoti hai. Sir bilkul thik hai rehte. To nahi zarurat padi. Aur ye wala severe wale mein nahi gaya ki isko humko ventilate karna pade. Sirf oxygen deke. Bakia magnesium sulfate or uh, uh, valium. This is control. Ho gaya. Uh, why don't we go for intrathecal baclofen in Pakistan? Is it very much costly? We have never provided it to people. The availability of the same thing is that it is not available. But there are many things that are available. For example, sugar attacks. 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 कि वो बहुत ज़्यादा कॉस्टली है हम गरीब लोग हैं हमारे यहाँ पब्लिक सेक्टर में शायद उसको हम एफोर्ड ना कर सकें बाय व्हाई नॉट बाय व्हाई नॉट इंट्राथीकल बैकलोफेन कि मरीज बेचारा स्पाज़म से जो है तड़प रहा होता है और हम कुछ नहीं कर सकते मैं मसल रिलैक्सेशन पे मसल रिलैक्सेशन दिए जा रहे होते ये बहुत विजिलेंट मॉनिटरिंग करनी होती है क्लिनिकल मॉनिटरिंग बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट होती है एक चार्ट बना के हमने लगाया हुआ है जिसमें पटेलर रिफ्लेक्स देख रहे होते हैं बार बार और मैग्नीशियम सल्फेट ज़्यादातर एडल्ट की बात कर रहे हैं टू ग्राम 1.5 ग्राम टू 1.5 वन इस पर चला रहे होते हैं इनको ट्वेंटी आवर्स और जहाँ उसका लेवल थेरापेटिक लेवल में आ जाता है बस उसको फिर उसी पर मेनटेन करते हैं कोशिश ही करते हैं कि फ्लक्चुएशन नहीं हो मैगनीशियम में अगर होता है तो उसको स्पैजम होते रहते हैं तो मैग्नीशियम सल्फेट एंड ये अपना जो बेंजोडाइजेपिन इससे मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम कंट्रोल हो जाता है कभी कभी बहुत सीवियर में आता है तो आपको फॉर सम टाइम मसल रिलैक्स करना पड़ता है वेंटिलेटर पे डालना पड़ता है थोड़ी देर के लिए इस दौरान आप अगर मैग्नीशियम लेवल मेंटेन कर लें तो वो हो जाता है ठीक एक बात दूसरी बात ये कि कभी कभी ऐसा होता है कि नहीं संभल रहा होता है तो आपको फिर दूसरी एंटी कन्वर्सन दे के समाइम देना पड़ता है फिनो टाइप की चीज़ थोड़ी देर के लिए इंट्राथीकल वाला ये कि अवेलेबल नहीं है तो मैं क्या करूं एक चीज़ लेकिन लिटरेचर में है इन्होंने दिया था लेकिन उस पर भी वो कह रहे हैं कि मॉर्टिलिटी पे इतना फ़र्क नहीं पड़ा है लेकिन स्पैजम कंट्रोल हो जाते हैं उसके तो पेशेंट के लिए पेनफुल कंडीशन नहीं रहती तो पेन के लिए हमारे पास दूसरी चार दवाएँ हैं वो यूज़ करते हैं अगर हमारे पास नहीं है तो नहीं लेकिन होनी चाहिए बिल्कुल सही है यू आई एग्री और सूडम इंडेक्स भी आने वाली है वैसे मैंने सुना है जल्दी आने वाली है 
रखरोनिम तो अवेलेबल है सर डॉक्टर रजा असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर ऑफ पलमोलॉजी एंड क्रिटिकल केयर माई क्वेश्चन इज फ्राम डॉक्टर फजात थैंक यू सर यू हैव एक्सप्लेंड वेरी वेल बट स्टिल द क्वेश्चन इज नॉट क्लियर वट इज द ड्रग फ्लूड ऑफ चॉइस अपार्ट फ्राम इंसेप्सिस अपार्ट फ्राम नॉर्मल सलाइन वी आर आंसर लिस्ट और इवन रेजिडेंट्स और स्टूडेंट्स दैट दे से दैट For example, ring related has low pH as compared to normal saline, and we see most of the time the septic patient are most of the time acidotic. Uh, acidotic. Apart from the complication you have described, is there head, uh, there any head-to-head -head, uh, trial? Because sepsis uh, surviving complaint is based on Cochrane review and multiple studies. So, is there any head-to-head uh, uh, -head trial that can uh, uh, suggest which fluid is better in sepsis? Right. Uh, thank you for the question. Pehla baat, which is the most optimal fluid? It does not exist. Okay. <laughs> so, again, uh, as part of the presentation, we have to look at the problems that the patient has, and then we have to take our own decision. Asa ho nahi sakta ke ham bolde bas ye hai aur plug and play kar de bas yehi chalega. Every fluid. has its own problems every patient so uh, every patient has their own physiology ek to hota hai bookish physiology phir insaan jo hai wo evolve karta rehta hai physiological changes ke sath for example people uh, evolve and accommodate let's say for example uh, mitral stenosis ya aortic stenosis but we as doctors we have uh, jab patient jis condition mein aata hai i don't know what the kidneys are how the liver is functioning i don't know uh, what is being absorbed or what can be absorbed or cannot be absorbed so we have to individualize treatment for each patient ye plug and play ho nahi sakta ki yaar ye char pahiye hain gaadi hai yahan se wahan pahuncha degi no we have to individualize fluid with everything sir ne bhi uh, bada acha detail mein bhi bataya ke there are so many factors uh, that we have to consider if it was that easy it would be there that is why they are guidelines they have suggestions but there is no hard level one evidence saying this is better than that jahan tak normal saline ki baat hai it's an economical thing it is easily producible it is easily available it is easily stored but again a lot of guidelines do say ke 2 liter 3 liter ke baad you know you should start thinking of some other fluid as well a more balanced fluid but initially it is easily available ke banana usko aasan hai it's normal saline 0.9% whereas if you look at the other solutions there's a lot of tweaking ye de wo de ye de so it's it's which is easier to make and store that is it. but uh, as for uh, the lots of trials going on but none as far as i know have given a hard evidence that this fluid is the optimal fluid this fluid should be used for sepsis ya this fluid should be used for trauma इसमें थोड़ा सा इसमें देखिए मकसद हमारा क्या है मकसद ये है कि ऑक्सीजनेट ऑक्सीजनेशन करनी है टिश्यू लेवल पे यही मकसद है इसी के लिए हमें ब्लड को ट्रांसपोर्ट करना है फ्रॉम लंग्स फ्रॉम हार्ट टू द पेरिफ्री यही करना है तो हमें इतना वॉल्यूम चाहिए और ऐसा वॉल्यूम चाहिए जो ऑक्सीजन को लेकर वहाँ पहुँचा रहा हो जहाँ पर टिश्यू पर चाहिए तो आपको ये भी देखना होगा इनका कहना बिल्कुल सही उसकी फिजियोलॉजी क्या है उसका हीमोग्लोबिन कितना है उसके अंदर प्रोटीन कितना है उसका किडनी फंक्शन कितना है उसके लिहाज से आप फ्लू डिसाइड करेंगे ना तो इस पर कोई एक रूल तो हो नहीं सकता तो आपको उस पेशेंट के लिए डिसाइड करना पड़ेगा क्या करना है कि हम ऑक्सीजनेटेड ब्लड टिश्यू तक पहुंचा दें बस ये सोचना है अगर ये समझ में आ गई बात तो आप फ्लू डिसाइड कर लेंगे काइंडली बी सीटेड I hope this session has been productive. Um, I would like our chair, Dr. Mehdi Hasan Mumtaz, to come on stage and give shields to our presenters. Dr. Mehdi Hasan Mumtaz. Uh, I would like to invite our first presenter, Dr. Sadika Aftab, to please come on stage and collect her shield.
डॉक्टर सफिया जफर थैंक यू सर सर यू कैन अगेन सिट ऑन यस सर थैंक यू सर नाउ आई वुड लाइक टू इनवाइट डॉक्टर अशरफ जिया टू कम ऑन स्टेज एंड डिस्ट्रीब्यूट द रेस्ट ऑफ द शील्ड्स डॉक्टर सैयद फरजाद सुल्तान प्लीज कम ऑन स्टेज सर डॉक्टर हमीदुल्ला सर प्लीज कम ऑन स्टेज सर एक एक शील और एक डॉक्टर सफिया पुरन थैंक यू सर नाउ आई वुड लाइक टू इनवाइट डॉक्टर सफिया टू कम ऑन स्टेज एंड प्रेजेंट शील्ड्स टू आर ऑनरेबल चेयर डॉक्टर सर आज डॉक्टर अशरफ जिया सर कोई बात नहीं आप आज ओके डॉक्टर मेहदी हसन थैंक यू सो मच सर नाउ डॉक्टर मैम मैम कैंडी डॉक्टर अशरफ जिया आर सेकेंड पैनलिस्ट थैंक यू सर डॉक्टर ताहिर अली प्लीज कम ऑन स्टेज डॉक्टर ताहिर यू शुड रिमेन ऑन द स्टेज मैडम प्लीज बैठ जाए ना आई वुड लाइक टू बॉदर ब्रिगेडियर सलीम साहब Dr Tahir Ali was speaker yesterday in the plenary session uh, but he left for some reasons and couldn't receive his shield so i want you to give uh, the yesterday's shield to him now okay thank you very much with this we come to a very productive session now the tea was supposed to be of 30 minutes but sh since we are short of time and the next session which is about the panel discussion which will be moderated by dr tahir ali very productive session so i request all of you to come back at 11 am sharp uh, see you then bas madam chai sath liye yahan baith jaye chai aur biscuit yahan le aaye
Hello, testing. Hello. 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 Hello, testing. Hello. Hello. Hello, hello. Bilal, bhai. Hello. Take it. Bye, John.